Um, I think I think everyone else was able to make this this two hour time work um, except for Tara. Yeah, Megan, I'm probably going to have to drop off at eleven. Um, okay, thanks, Julie. Yeah. All right. Um, so Marion put the um, agenda for today in the chat, and I think the the plan is to um, dig a bit, dig more into the work of the subcommittee and do some planning discussion um, and some updates today. We had a really brief meeting last time because that was we the the subcommittee members really only had a, a half hour time window during the month of August, so that was a pretty brief meeting. Um, and so, oh gosh, and I don't know if we have minutes for that meeting. I can check. I can't recall who recorded them, but on that note, <laughs> at least for today, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Megan or Marion, but my understanding is that uh, with the with the change that was communicated by Jane in terms of um, the role that ANR and state staff will play for the council. Um, there will no longer be dedicated state staff to help take uh, notes. So I think we're going to be doing a rotating volunteer to record notes. So, um, and we'll just rotate that evenly across the, the subcommittee to balance it out. So if anybody wants to volunteer for that today, <clears throat> um, and then send it to Megan and I afterwards, that would that would be much appreciated. And we do have a template for minutes that I'll put in the chat. That should make it easier to use. Thanks, Marion. Any volunteers <laughs> for today? I'm, I'm happy to take minutes. Oh, thank you, Claire. Appreciate that. <clears throat> um, okay, so I, I don't think I, I see that um, we have minutes from our brief meeting in August, but I can revisit the recording and try to um, put that together for the record um, at some point here. But um, we, in terms of the date for our next meeting, we've agreed that this time slot on Thursdays works well for everyone generally. And um, if we tried to meet kind of towards the middle of each month on a Thursday, that actually um, makes it so that many of us would be jumping right from this meeting to a cross-sector mitigation subcommittee meeting, which seems kind of like a long uh, slog of meetings for some of us. So um, I, I was looking to see if there were other Thursdays during the months of October and November that would work. Um, there's also a lot of holidays coming up, so that made it challenging to find other Thursdays. Um, so I'll continue to, to look for that, um, but assuming this time slot on Thursdays still works for everyone, I will um, try to work so that, make it work so that we don't have multiple um, subcommittee meetings on, on a Thursday. Megan, my understanding, maybe one possible suggestion just for consideration and to float now to see if it works for folks is my understanding is the cross sector mitigation subcommittee meetings are the third Thursday of each month. So mm -hmm. I think we did the second Thursday that would avoid those and avoid the holiday conflicts. So okay. I think that would be like um, October 13th, mm -hmm. uh, November 10th, and December 8th. Okay. Yeah, that looks great. Um, I'm, I'm going to most likely be out of town on work travel on the 13th, um, but I, I think um, maybe that would be okay, <laughs> I, hopefully. Um, and I, I could um, ask uh, Colin to help fill in um, any co-chair duties for me in my absence, if that is helpful, Jared. Also happy to try to find a different day for that month if it works, but if it doesn't, then I I think it's going to be tricky because of the conflict with cross sector and just you know other conflicts potentially in the month of October. So um, and it it's nice to have the meetings kind of evenly spread out um, so that we're not you know 
meeting um, too frequently enough that we don't have enough like updates or time to do work in between meetings. So, um, so that's fine. I, I'm, I'm okay with that if others are, if that works for others. And I can, Marion and I can work to put those on the calendar. Okay, um, so next we, as I said, we had a really brief meeting in August and so um, wanted to, to really spend a good amount of time during this meeting getting to know each other because we have a bunch of new members, which is fantastic. Um, so I, I think we'll just take an opportunity to go around um, the Zoom boxes and just um, say hi and introduce ourselves um, and maybe just mention, um, you know, your your background and your interest in the work of this this subcommittee in particular. Um, so so I'll start. Um, my name is Megan O'Toole. I'm the climate change mitigation coordinator at the Agency of Natural Resources um, before uh, taking on that role at ANR. Um, I was the attorney for the Air Quality and Climate Division um, doing a mix of work related to air contaminant emissions from mobile and stationary sources. And then of course, um, working on uh, greenhouse gas mitigation related uh, litigation, uh, regulatory matters and um, kind of just doing other general counsel related work for the agency. Um, so in, in my current role, I'm in the process of transitioning to the newly formed Climate Action Office uh, with, with Jane and Marion and uh, looking forward to continuing to work um, from a mitigation perspective and then also working closely with others in the agency that I think will also be making that transition um, in terms of working on the greenhouse gas emissions inventory and some of the supplemental tools that we're developing to complement that body of work um, and then other uh, technical and, and modeling work that we have um, either happening now or soon to be happening within the agency. So um, I'll kick it over to you, Jared. Thanks, Megan. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Jared Duvall. I have served for the last five and a half years as the executive director of the Energy Action Network. I, I know many of you are familiar, some of you are members. Um, the Energy Action Network is really two things. Um, first and foremost, it's a, it's a network of member organizations, basically any organization, business or entity in the state of Vermont um, that want, is, wants to see Vermont meet uh, the commitments that we have made, um, uh, both on emissions reduction requirements and on renewable energy uh, goals um, coming together to, to, to work to, to try to do that collaboratively. It's a very kind of broad and diverse network from businesses to nonprofits to utilities to fuel dealers to colleges and universities. Um, and in support of that network and the state of Vermont's efforts overall, we have a small what we call backbone nonprofit organization, which is what I lead. And we primarily focus on doing independent tracking and analysis. Um, on emissions, energy, uh, equity in the economy. We do this annual progress report that just came out last week. Um, and that is to make sure that uh, both the network conversations and conversations in the state of Vermont are grounded in the latest available and highest quality data and analysis um, uh, so that we're having evidence-based uh, conversations about where we stand and, and where we're all trying to get to together. Um, so yeah, um, I was, because of that role, um, I was appointed to the council in the seat to represent a Vermont based organization with expertise in energy and data analysis. Uh, so that was a, a Senate appointment. Um, and yeah, I'll just note that before that I served as, uh, economic development director at the agency of commerce, working with our working lands and green economy sectors. And my graduate training is in both social science research and in public policy analysis, including economics and statistics. So that's my background and info. Really glad to be co-chairing this subcommittee with Megan and working with all of you. I also serve on the cross-sector mitigation subcommittee um, as a couple of other folks here do. Um, I will pass it over just in terms of going along the screen um, to Kevin. Hi folks, I'm Kevin Geiger. I'm the director of planning at the Regional Planning Commission 
uh, that goes by the name of the Two Rivers Atacuichi Regional Commission. So there are 11 of us in the state. Um, you may know whatever your respective regional commission is. I've worked down here um, 22 years or so. Before that, I was assistant director up in the kingdom for that one. Um, so I've been around a little while. Uh, I work on the policy realm, of course, and then RPCs work in project management. Anytime you say a town will do, what you really mean is an RPC will help the town do X, um, if it's any of the smaller towns, which they virtually all are. Um, we do energy policy, of course, and that translates into climate policy, as does a lot of our transportation and emergency management work. Uh, I helped lead the state in the buyouts of uh, houses after Irene, and that's, to me, probably the biggest immediate thing that we have is, you know, it floods hard and then things wash away. And how do we stop doing that? Uh, let's see. Uh, next on my screen to the left is Marion. Hi, everyone. Marion Wolves. I work with the Agency of Natural Resources. Um, like Megan, I'm transitioning to a role in the new Climate Action Office. So previously served as the Global Warming Solutions Act coordinator, working closely with Jane to support all the subcommittees in the Climate Council and drafting the Climate Action Plan. And I'm transitioning to a role focused on resilience and adaptation coordination. So looking forward to that. Um, not on the subcommittee, but here to provide technical support with the Zoom meeting um, and any other questions you all have, but excited to continue working with you all. And I will transition over to Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine Lothar. Um, I think I mentioned last time that in 2001, I read Tim Flannery's book, The Weathermakers, and that changed my life. Hey, Catherine, can you speak up a little bit? Turn my volume up. We're having a hard time hearing you. Can you hear me now? No? It's very quiet. We can just barely hear you. How about now? Same. Well, I can, can you get closer you? to your microphone? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is odd because it normally works fine. I don't know what's going on. Can you hear me now? It's it's even quieter almost. <laughs> Sorry. Is microphone covered up with something, perhaps? Um, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I'm try, um, using my earplug thing. Can you hear me now? Yay. Okay, um, I started by saying in 2001, I read Tim Flannery's book, The Weathermakers, and that changed my life forever. And I taught at Goddard from 1997 until 2020. And during that time, I created the BA in Sustainability Program. And I offered courses in climate change, and I chaired the Sustainability Committee. And I did the carbon inventory for the college and helped them become carbon neutral by 2018. And I managed an email list and send a weekly email to about 500 people. And in 2017, I attended one of Al Gore's climate reality leadership trainings and joined his group. And um, I'm very grateful to be part of this group and part of working on climate change issues in Vermont. I'm also on the um, Climate Council at Hunger Mountain Co-op and I chair the Carbon Neutrality Committee there and helping the co-op working on helping the co-op become carbon neutral. Um, Jared Ulmer. Thank you, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jared Ulmer. I manage the climate and health program at the Vermont Department of Health. Um, I'd say my two main roles there and interest are in um, analyzing and, and raising awareness about climate change impacts on health and you know, helping identify strategies for, for responding those, um, adapting to, to those changes and, and minimizing health impacts. That's sort of one bucket of work and the other bucket is supporting uh, climate change mitigation strategies that help uh, promote health, um, such as um, home weatherization um, or uh, increased walking and biking. 
Um, so those are those are my hats. Um, I also have um, my background is in epidemiology and urban planning um, and sort of the intersection of of, um, of land use and transportation planning um, with with health. Um, so I also bring that perspective. Um, and I see Ken Jones next on my screen. Right, I am Ken Jones. I am in the process of retiring from the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, where I did economic research on a range of topics, including energy and climate work. So I contributed to the Comprehensive Energy Plan at the Public Service Department, as well as some staffing work for the Climate Action Plan. Um, I've been engaged with climate issues for a long time. I was actually worked for the state back in the late 80s, early in 1990, when the state did a comparative risk project and identified climate change as one of the largest risks facing the state. Um, um, so I also do work locally. I've helped found the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee. Um, I'm on the board of the Clean Energy Development Fund. Um, and yeah, this is a topic that's hugely important to me. Um, next on mine, let's see, Megan, Catherine, Jared, Kevin, Claire. Thanks, Ken. Everyone, Claire McElvenny, um, actually stepping into a new role at the Department of Public Service recently as our data and equity policy manager, um, where I lead sort of two core work areas, one around data management, um, looking at you know, tracking the data we collect and how we use it to track progress towards meeting our renewable and clean energy goals, and then hopefully working towards making that data more publicly and transparently accessible. And then also um, our work around sort of energy equity ad advocacy, which of course in part uh, overlaps with data and how we track and assess progress. And um, also some sort of broader work around public engagement, how we bring more voices into our work on energy policy. Um, I've been at the department for about two and a half years uh, before stepping into this role where I work sort of more broadly on supporting regional and uh, local uh, municipalities with their energy planning under Act 174, worked on utility integrated resource plans and renewable energy compliance. Um, and before joining the department, I had been working full-time towards my PhD in natural resources with a focus on uh, smart grid energy systems, looking at the intersection of human behavior, um, technology, and policy, um, and particularly how we integrate social science insights into sort of technical systems modeling. Um, and still working on wrapping that up in my quote free time, um, but excited to work in with this group um, for a lot of the reasons that overlaps a lot with my work area. Um, and I also support the Just Transition Subcommittee of the Climate Council as a staff member. Um, so yeah, excited to work with this group and um, all your diverse backgrounds. So with that, I'll pass it to Richard. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, Claire. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just starting my fifth year living full time in Vermont. Although um, I started coming to Vermont in 1948, quite a while ago, mostly in summers. Um, I'm trained as a physician. I'm an, I have an MD. I worked in and have an and I have an MPH, a Master in Public Health. I I worked for 35 years in state health departments as an epidemiologist. I supervised uh, bright young people like Jared Almer. Um, and uh, I always enjoyed uh, that, that role. Um, I retired from the Florida Department of Health in 2012. And uh, I decided I wanted to focus on, on uh, climate change and act activities to try to mitigate climate change. Uh, I got involved with an organization called Sustainable Tallahassee. And for Sustainable Tallahassee, I developed a greenhouse gas inventory for Leon County, Florida, which I did two annual updates to that kind of work used the skills that I had learned as a public health epidemiologist for how to find and organize data um, and, uh, and how to display it and how to make good use of it. When I moved to Vermont, um, I joined the Middlebury Town Energy Committee and the Climate Economy Action Center of Addison County, um, SEAC, of which I'm a board member. 
Um, for SEAC, I also supervised a Middlebury College student in developing a greenhouse gas inventory for Addison County, which we did in the summer of, uh, of 2020. And just last night, uh, I finished a complete draft of an update for the year 2020 of, uh, of our county greenhouse gas inventory. And I'm seeking comment from, from people that helped us, um, helped us find data. Um, on this count, on this, uh, subcommittee, I have recently been a member of the, um, biomass task group, which has been very interesting. It's been a very educational and enjoyable ta set of tasks. Um, I hope, um, I worked for 35 years in state government, never in Vermont, but in state government in Montana, Colorado, Ohio, West Virginia, and finally 20 some years in Florida. Um, I thought that I had, uh, used up my enthusiasm for working in state government and here I, but here I am, um, engaged in state government again. And I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be part of, uh, part of this, part of this, uh, important venture. Thanks all. And, um, speaking of state government, let's have Julie Moore go next. Thanks Richard. Uh, so I'm Julie Moore. I'm the Secretary of Natural Resources and have been in this role for almost six years at this point. Um, by virtue of being Secretary, I'm also a member of the Climate Council. Um, and the agency itself, I would say, serves as, as a de facto hub for state government uh, around climate action, with work being done in a number of different agencies and departments, including several of those represented here today, health, public service, uh, as well as VTrans, agriculture, et cetera. Um, and with the, the creation of a, the Climate Action Office as part of this year's budget, um, we're sort of codifying that role as the, the hub of activities in state government. Uh, my background is in civil engineering, and then most of my career has been spent working in water resources projects. And there's a strong nexus between um, water quality, clean water concerns, and uh, climate change. So it, it's work that's near and dear to me, in addition to being work that's central to the mission of the agency. And I will turn it to uh, Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. It's really good to be here. I'm having some very unusual computer issues this morning. so. Notice that I'm kind of jumping in and out. Um, I hope they rectify themselves, um, but I will do my best to attend. I am um, coming to you from the University of Vermont right now, where I'm the Director of Sustainability. Um, prior to that, I was with VEIC, Sustainable Energy Company in Winooski for five years as a senior consultant working around the country with municipalities and um, colleges and universities on energy efficiency and energy use and um, really bringing the human lens to, to how we're using energy. Um, my PhD was at, at UVM in energy and behavioral science. So I'm a social scientist by training um, prior to that, I was a director of sustainability at a small graduate program in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, um, called the Teton Science Schools. That this has been um, sustainability and climate change has been the the core theme in my career, um, really since the beginning. And right now, we're working on a comprehensive sustainability plan um, at the University of Vermont. We're also undergoing a greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which we've done twice before. Um, trying to get a sense of, you know, every everything we're doing on campus and what we're responsible for. So I'm really excited to be here. I hope I can be helpful. I'm not serving, you know, in a, an official capacity representing UVM, but um, I'm certainly bringing that experience and hoping that we can share the resources we have to, to address the issue in front of us. I think Jay and Leslie Ann have not chimed in yet, if I'm correct. That's right. I'll, I'll self volunteer. Can you hear me okay? 
Great. Yeah, so Jay Schaefer, I'm currently the chief science officer at a startup company called Disaster Tech. I work remotely out of Danville, Vermont, and I lived in the kingdom for about 20 years. Uh, my background and training is in atmospheric science. I was previously professor of atmospheric science at Northern Vermont University. And I've walked a few different lines and themes in my career recently. One is extreme weather and understanding how extreme weather and climate change are related. Uh, Leslie Ann and myself uh, overlap in that space pretty well. And then also power grid applications. Uh, I've started a small company and commercialized technology on power outage prediction and basically resilience through prediction and preparedness before storms to help, uh, you know, to help all of us watch Netflix a little faster after a big storm comes through, as I like to say there. Um, and and more, more importantly, my passion is just around science and, and action and moving things forward and, and just wanting to see the change and bring my knowledge to help all this stuff forward. So I just get impatient with these things and recently made that career change to the, to the private sector um, to help scale software that can help you know, the world be more resilient to, to climate change. Thank you. So good morning, everybody. Leslie and Dupini Giroux. Um, I'm an applied hydroclimatologist by training and at the University of Vermont for the last 25 years. I'm in the Department of Geography and Geosciences there. I'm also the Vermont State Climatologist. And I think my, my next set of expertise revolves around climate, climate change, climate variability, geospatial technologies, um, uh, education, and working directly with, with stakeholders around the state in, in terms of being a portal between questions being asked on the ground and some of the federal resources that I have access to as part of being um, state climatologists. So um, I've been on the subcommittee since the beginning and I also am on a couple of the uh, task groups, including the Municipal Vulnerability Index and the Climate um, Toolkit. So happy to be here. And I think, um, Colin is the only other person who I see around the squares that we haven't said hi to. And while we maybe wait for Colin, Steve, oh, there he is, go ahead. Uh, and after you, Colin, Steve Crowley is a frequent uh, participant in these meetings. Um, and just so we cover everybody, even though Steve is not a member of the subcommittee, as a member of the public, I want to invite you to introduce yourself after Colin, Steve. Great. Thanks, Jared. Sorry, sorry for the wait, everybody. Um, Colin Smythe, I work for uh, Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation, uh, currently in the Air Quality and Climate Division. And I'm, um, uh, yeah, just kind of support here, staff support, technical support um, for you all. And I kind of involved in that I put together the greenhouse gas inventory for the state. Um, yeah, that's me, thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for inviting me to share here, Jared. Um, so I'm Steve Crowley, I, I live in South Burlington. I um, had a long career as a science teacher, high school science, uh, mostly Winooski High School. Um, focusing on uh, the life sciences and earth sciences side of the equation. Uh, and I uh, taught climate science and, and other related topics for many years. Uh, and I am the uh, volunteer energy chair for the Vermont chapter of the Sierra Club, uh, which I've been doing for quite a few years. And, and I've been uh, involved in, in uh, research and education and advocacy on climate policy for uh, since, since probably the mid nineties uh, and helped Sierra Club start its uh, climate program nationally. And, uh, and uh, have, uh, it's been interesting to see how much um, hasn't changed about what we're trying to accomplish, but maybe now we are starting to get somewhere. So I appreciate the work of everybody on the committee. It's, it's been a pleasure to watch uh, everybody figure out how to make progress. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Steve, and thanks everyone. Um, that was really great to hear from everyone, especially new folks. Um, so 
uh, we're, we're pretty much right on schedule, which is great. Um, I'm going to dive right in next to some updates on uh, contract work that the subcommittee has been directly engaged in and that it stems from recommendations that the subcommittee put forward in the climate action plan. Um, so I'll, I'll start first and just give a, an update on the life cycle analysis RFP. Uh, not much, I think, has changed since we spoke in August, except that we're moving forward into um, entering into a contract with uh, the contractor that will be working with us on this project. Um, and, and again, just to just to briefly go review um, what this project is all about. Um, as I mentioned, this stems from a recommendation from this subcommittee in the Climate Action Plan to for the state to undertake uh, a life cycle emission analysis for energy use specifically in Vermont. And um, this subcommittee, as well as a corresponding task group, had, has been working on review of first a request for information and then a request for proposals to help um, facilitate this work. And so we uh, reviewed uh, a set of, of responses that we received earlier this summer, and the task group selected a contractor, and Jane is currently working on putting together a contract so that we can begin that work, hopefully soon. Um, the idea is that this analysis will um, supplement our current uh, gross emissions inventory that, that Colin leads, and it will help to, um, it will exist a, a, as a parallel tool uh, to that gross emissions inventory and, and be used obviously to help inform policy decision making uh, surrounding uh, the, the choices that we make about actions to take to, to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, obviously from a life cycle perspective. So that um, I think is still in the works in terms of contracting, um, but we do plan to, um, you know, once the contract is executed, we will begin that work with the contractor, and obviously, this this subcommittee will um, be involved and in, and receive updates on that work. So, um, so that's what's happening with life cycle. Any questions? I know that's not much of a change from last time. So, Megan, uh, I don't because I'm new to the committee. Does everybody have a copy of the RFIs and all that type of stuff? Um, we, we can certainly share that, Kevin. I think um, it's posted in various places on the climate change website in relation to the work of this committee, but we can dig that out and, and send links as a follow up to the meeting so that you can get, uh, get up to speed on, on the, that work. That'd be great. Thanks. Sure. And Megan, um, if oh, sorry, go ahead. Let me just comment that when you read that, um, you'll see that the winning bidder has a subcontract with Synapse Energy Economics, um, whose principal is Asa Hopkins, um, and the the resemblance in names is not a coincidence. Um, so I I have been trying very very hard to stay out of any decision making related to this particular uh, proposal. And anytime somebody starts talking decision making, I'm going to get off get off the call. And that's why. Well, I think I think we're. Um... I think we've decided, Richard, so maybe we can, I think we're now moving into the implementation phase. Um, so hopefully you feel more comfortable <laughs> in that phase of the work, because um, we, I think, would greatly benefit from having you as part of the implementation discussions. Megan, I was just going to ask if you have it handy or can recall from memory, um, just a brief outline of the of the rough timeline. I know that it, there's a little bit of uncertainty in terms of when the contract gets finalized and when the meetings start, but just in terms of like the overall progression of work and when we're expecting to have, you know, some, some of those key kind of moments in the contract and drafts and, and final products hoped for. Um, I can't recall off the top of my head, but we can review that. Um, it's, I, I mean, I think we're planning to move along as swiftly as, as possible, given that there's the possibility for this work to inform many other discussions that are happening either within the Climate Council or in state government, so um, or the legislature as well. Uh, so I think we are hoping to, to move quickly um, and, uh, you know, not dawdle, <laughs> but I, I'm not sure of the exact time frame. I can check the RFP. 
but yes, I know. I mean, I know Jane is working as quickly as she can on the contract piece. Um, and we're just, you know, administratively at the, in, within the agency, we're a bit backlog um, just because we, we don't have as much administrative support in our business offices as we typically do. And so we're trying to be really patient with those folks and, and work with them as best we can, understanding that they are understaffed at the moment. So. Any other questions on life cycle? All right, and I don't, uh, Jane is not able to join us today because um, she's working on contracts, as I mentioned, so, um, which is great. Uh, but we have, um, a, a Leslie Ann mentioned, is working on the Municipal Vulnerability Index um, as well, and Marion might have an update, but I welcome Leslie Ann or Marion to um, chime in with an update on the Municipal Vulnerability Index contract. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Do you want to go ahead, Leslie? Ann? No, I was about to say you 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 start, Mary, and then I can fill in pieces. But maybe the there. only real update I have is that the um, small group of folks members from this subcommittee, so Leslie Ann um, and Derek, Jared, I believe, and then members from the Rural Resilience Adaptation Subcommittee, as well as members from Just Transitions, um, reviewed. I think we had five or six proposals. Um, went through a really rigorous process and back and forth with um, the candidates or the um, proposals uh, from the contractors and then ended up selecting a contractor. Um, I believe that Jane is working on the contract, so should have that finalized soon and then we'll share the, the final folks, but we're really excited. Um, it was a really robust proposal, um, included a lot of focus on um, engagement with um, marginalized and impacted communities, equity focus, and also a really good focus on um, data gathering and um, display of that information. So. Um, excited about that, and I think I uh, should have more information soon once that co contract is finalized. Yeah, definitely. And it, it's going to be nice to actually see a lot of this move forward in this space. So really happy to see the, the final outcome. All right, and then the final update um, is on another piece of work that uh, was uh, recommended by this subcommittee in the Climate Action Plan. And our agricultural emissions RFP is um, being led by Colin. So Colin, if you're able to give an update on where we are with that process, that'd be great. Sure, I'm happy to. And um, I think there may not be a whole lot of additional information to share on this one either, but, um, but we are getting close to releasing the RFP. And so I guess for, uh, for any of you who may not have kind of heard about this RFP already, it's, it's essentially an investigation um, into multiple different tools for quantifying emissions in the agricultural sector, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the agricultural sector. Um, and kind of comparing the different tools and available data sets for Vermont and coming up with the best way in terms of kind of a net framework, but also comparing that tool and framework with the methodologies in the gross inventory and kind of how they relate to the IPCC guidance. Um, so that's, that's kind of a, a broad overview of, of what the ask is. Um, and I believe the RFP is kind of in the very final stages before it's getting posted. And I, I don't know the actual date, but I would imagine, um, yeah, in, in the next week or so would be my guess, but I haven't heard for sure. Um, yeah, any, any questions from anybody on that? Uh, Colin, Richard? this is Richard. I have, I have, I might have missed it, but is, does this RFP also address quantifying sequestration and sinks that can result from activity of farmers as well as releases? Yes. So the tools, the tools that are kind of being put forward to be investigated and kind of compared against each other and hoping to find the most kind of the best estimate that's also has all the data available and hopefully we could carry forward. Um, they are mainly kind of net estimates. So yes, they would generally incorporate that, that sequestration. And I know um, the uh, ag agency has been, has been very kind of 
concern with the fact that kind of current management practices are not being captured. And so that's definitely going to be a focus of this is to, is to make sure we address that concern of theirs and kind of incorporate those current and future management practices um, that farmers are, are doing already or will be doing. I'm pleased to say, I mentioned earlier that I, I finished a complete draft of the Addison County greenhouse gas inventory last night. And one of the things that I did was to take the 2017 USDA Census of Agriculture, which tells me how many acres of cropland in Addison County are being managed with legume cover crops and how many acres are being managed with low-till and no-till management, according to the 2017 census, and then combine that with USDA's Comet online tool that says how much carbon gets sequestered per acre if you do those two things. Mm -hmm. I meant to make estimates of my, our first estimates of the amount of carbon sequestered as a result of those practices by Addison County farmers. Unfortunately, the numbers are not very large, but really? they, um, but but it, this is the first time that that we've been able to do that, and I'm I'm pleased with that. And I I'm going to send you you um, Colin um, the draft uh, inventory document for review, and I hope that's one of the things you'll look at. That's great, Richard. Thanks, and congratulations on getting it done. Um, I, I will say, I think Comet mm -hmm. is one of the tools um, that that will be reviewed as this part of our part of this RFP too. Just for your information. Yeah. Could you send that inventory to me too, Richard, Catherine Lothar, or maybe even all of us would like to see it? I don't know. Um, I'm yes. You'll you'll eventually get to see it. Um, I'm starting with the people that actually helped us while we were developing it. Okay. <laughs> and then and then and, and then move out. I'll just also add that um, I think since the last time we met as a subcommittee, the task group working on the ag emissions RFP had a joint meeting with the um, ag and ecosystem subcommittee for for their to give them an opportunity to review the RFP. And so Colin incorporated the feedback from that committee, which was pretty minimal. I think they were generally um, uh, agreeable with the direction that we had gone in with the draft and were supportive or are supportive. Um, so it's moving forward with that input as well. Um, and I'll just um, remind folks that this, the work that um, we will be doing um, with a contractor in relation to this RFP is going to be funded with a grant from the U.S. Climate Alliance for technical assistance that they're offering to the state of Vermont, um, which is great. So we're trying to execute the grant with the Climate Alliance to fund the work and then also get the RFP posted. Um, and so that there's just a, you know, a few things that need to line up for all of that to happen. So hopefully we will be able to post the RFP within the next couple of weeks. Um, but again, we've got limited resources on the business office side of things at ANR. So we are working with that, but hopefully moving forward soon. That, that's great. Thanks, Megan. I, sh I should have mentioned that piece of it. Um, I, one other thing I will just add in is that um, we did extend the timeline a little bit on that RFP from kind of what had been in there originally, um, just to make sure that the contractor is going to have enough time to complete all the tasks. And um, yes, so just to flag that for everyone. All right. Any other questions on contractual work before we move on to the budget discussion? I do wonder um, if it's okay and not to kind of put you on the spot, Colin, but I am curious, given that we've talked about updates to the life cycle analysis and ag emissions RFP, um, because those will either be supplements to or presumably somehow referenced or incorporated into the next uh, greenhouse gas inventory that the state releases. I'm wondering if there's any update on the timing of, of that process um, or, or not. Sure, Jared. Um, I I'm not sure I can totally commit to anything, but I I will say I we are we're going to try to have a draft of it done. Um, I think by December sometime, and I I don't know about the total release. I'm I'm still working through a lot of that, and and honestly, I think 
the supplemental pieces are going to be an interesting challenge just because I think they are going to be completed later, hopefully, than the inventory is completed. And so I, I'm not sure we, we need to have some internal discussions about what the kind of release of those all is going to look like and whether that'll be together or kind of all in one location side by side where you can download everything. I, I'm not sure what that's going to look like yet, but um, that's that's about what I've got for you. But I'm right. I'm working to working to get the data all set for that as fast as I can. <laughs> Thanks, Ken, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I, th I think this is related to that topic, but has there been any discussion in this subcommittee about developing more um, real-time estimates, not estimates, real-time um, reporting on the transportation and thermal side in that gasoline, diesel, natural gas, heating oil, and propane um, consumption levels can uh, are can be gathered in a much more timely fashion. And again, they may not be perfect and it's not a, a direct one-to-one um, -one relationship with the inventory, but it does give a sense of how, for example, changes in the heating season, you know, the last two years have been fairly warm, but certainly the changes with regards to COVID and transportation. Um, but it, it also, I think, helps promote the public understanding of progress and lack of progress. So has, so is, is that something that's on our agenda to develop? And maybe this is related to the monitoring and assessment framework, um, but, but the question is, is this on our plate to develop more short-term reporting so that Vermonters and the council can, can see how we're doing? Thanks, Ken. Just briefly, before that gets answered, I noticed that um, Tara joined. Thank you for joining, Tara. I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself uh, to the committee, and then we can proceed onward. Uh, of course. Thanks, Jared. Um, I'm Tara Kukarni. I'm an engineering faculty member at Norwich University in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. And I also just started uh, a new role as the Associate Provost for Research at the University. Uh, so double hats right now and double offices. Uh, looking forward to working on this committee with all of you. Thanks. I'll just say briefly in terms of Ken's question and then I'd be curious um, your response, Colin. I think one of the things that um, DEC and ANR, or the Department of Environmental Conservation and Agency of Natural Resources have done really well in past inventories um, is show where there are uh, pieces of, uh, where there are data that um, we have sooner that um, can be projected uh, versus, you know, a placeholder value that was carried forward. Um, you know, I think last year, the inventory only officially went through 2017, but if you looked later in the report, it had all of the, it had either almost all or all of the 2018 values ready, and we could see that there were even some for 2019 that were either carry forwards, which there's much less confidence in, or there was a preliminary estimate. But I, I think your question is a, is a great one, Ken, because I mean, as you know better than I, my, my sense is that we do have some preliminary data on some of the big drivers of emissions in terms of fuel sales. And we can get that not just from waiting for federal agencies, like getting information from, um, uh, you know, the Energy Information Administration, EIA or, or others, um, but directly from, from JFO based on uh, tax receipts uh, from things like gasoline and diesel sales in Vermont to get a quicker look. Um, so I think it's a great question. I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on it as well, Colin and others. Sure, and I'll, I'll answer um, as best I can. Others feel free to, to jump in as well. But um, yes, I would say that is, that's definitely a good question. I think part of that, you're right, Ken, will probably be captured in the measuring and tracking progress. But um, I will tell you that I, I'm working right now, in fact, at trying to incorporate some of that JFO data in. And um, and I think, um, I guess I'll maybe give a little spoiler alert that that I most of the data 
in the inventory is going to be able to be completed through 2020. I'm not sure if that's going to be true for everything. Um, so, so Jer, the projections you were talking about, I say projections, the kind of forecast for a year or two that you're talking about. I don't know how much of 2021 will be able to be covered in that, but but you're right, Ken. The JFO data I think will go certainly through 2021, um, at, at least a lot of it. And and I will also say I, I'm meeting with. Claire um, fairly soon about some of that data and and trying to incorporate that in for the thermal sector too. And I need to I need to understand a little better that that thermal sector data from JFO to to get a better sense of whether or not it actually does capture all of the kind of all the fuels that would be captured in that kind of larger federal data sets and are incorporated into these tools. Um, so I need to do a little bit more digging in that. But but yes, I, I am planning to use that for transportation and um, and hopefully for the thermal or RCI sector um, in the next iteration. So, <clears throat> so I guess hopefully that answers your question. Um, but the, at least that's my my take on it. Um, but I agree that a more timely, a more timely kind of data source is is great and um this is at least more timely than it has been in the past if we can if we can utilize that jfo data all right should Anything we else on that? Yeah, I, just, I didn't want to cut anyone off. If there was other discussion there, but should we move on to budget? Anything else on contractual work? Yeah, I'll, I'll just say as one parting thought um, on, on that conversation, I think to the extent that there can be 2021 data that is pointed to or referenced or included, I think that that will be really um, helpful so that, because I think we all know that 2020 was an outlier year. And um, I think the initial uh, data that we're seeing uh, is that a lot of, uh, at least on the transportation side, a, a lot of the um, fuel use and associated greenhouse gas pollution has gone back up in 2021 and 2022. And so if it stops in 2020 showing a downward trend, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be, um, I, th I think people could take away the, the, <laughs> the, or get the wrong impression. So I think that'll be just a, a communications challenge in terms of the 2020 data, but the extent to which we can see how much some of those were durable versus how much some of those were, were really blips due to, you know, the initial shutdowns, um, that, that'll just, of course, Colin and you and everybody else knows that, but I think it's just worth flagging that that'll be a unique challenge of data presentation and communication, given what happened in 2020 with the, yeah. Yeah, I'll just say definitely, definitely agree with that, Jared, and um, point point taken. Um, yeah, I'll say for 2021, I, I and Ken or, or Jared, feel free to chime in or anybody else, but I think diesel has gotten pretty much back up to where it was pre-pandemic. I'm not sure gasoline quite has, and I'm not sure about VMT quite yet, but I think that will be an interesting thing going forward to see yeah, if we do totally rebound or even go above or stay below. Um, yeah. You know, gasoline is still significantly less, almost 10% less than pre-COVID. And that, that's through June of 2022. So there have been some permanent changes in transportation patterns. Part of that is the relationship to the closure of the Canadian border, which is which is reopening. But even then, that, that border crossing is still way lower than it used to be, because it's still, anyone who's tried to do it, it's still not trivial um, to, to cross the border. So that's part of it. But I think also commuting patterns, as I'll use myself as an example, even though I walked, I didn't drive. Um, I no longer commute. I didn't commute to work this year. <laughs> uh, 
um, and a lot of people are in that situation. But it's it's almost 10% lower than pre-COVID gasoline. And you're right, diesel isn't, which raises the question about, about those commercial uses of transportation and sort of separating out those policies, recognizing um, that it clearly is a different set of, of consumer decisions. It looked to me from, I'm only looking at the Addison County data that heating fuels were up a little in 2020 while uh, transportation fuels were down. And, and that's also pretty consistent with COVID. One of the things that happened is because people didn't go to work, those folks that used to turn the heat down in their homes during the workday um, didn't. And, and, and it's also interesting if you look at electricity use patterns, residential electricity use went up as the result of COVID while industrial and commercial went down. So again, I, I think that these pieces of information are useful because you know, COVID is, it made some permanent changes. And so understanding that is, is something that's really, I think, important for us as we look at some of the policies to uh, influence future fuel use. One more piece on fuel use um, at the Hunger Mountain Co-op in Montpelier. I, a few months ago, I did a sort of walk through and looked at all the products and where they were from. And many of the canned products were from the other side of the world. And I think relocalizing the food system is going to become increasingly important because the co-op is also having a difficult time even getting products because of drought and fires and floods. And I think that would, this would be an important piece for us to focus on in this group, something I do at the co-op, and I think it would be good to include in the work that we do. All right, thanks, everyone. Um, any final thoughts on that work before we move to the next item? Okay, um, so we've been tasked and all the subcommittees have been tasked with um, uh, lifting up uh, budget priorities um, for a broader proposal that will come from the Climate Council um, for the fiscal year 24 budget, which will begin um, July 1st of 2023. And um, I, I sent some materials earlier this morning and I'm sorry that they were kind of sent last minute. Um, your your co-chairs of this subcommittee have been very busy the last few weeks. And so we may not have been on top of as, as much as we should be on um, circulating material. But um, I think that uh, what I've seen other subcommittees doing um, and hearing from uh, others in the climate council meeting that happened earlier this week, is uh, reviewing um, the, these uh, or, or talking about and, and thinking about how to lift up new budget priorities or extending existing budget priorities in the context of the recommendations that were put forward in the climate action plan and kind of reviewing the work that we had recommended there um, and, and identifying work that's either ongoing or that has not um, potentially started yet. Um, so I, I'll just share that, you know, that given that I, I started with a, just a, a review of the recommendations that this subcommittee had made in the climate action plan. Um, and I, I sent that this around this morning. So um, there's, you know, three different pieces that accompany the scientific underpinning of the climate action plan chapter. And just to review, so the social cost of carbon analysis was work that this subcommittee focused on um, in, the, in the climate action plan development process. And then the review of the greenhouse gas inventory and the supplemental tools that we've put forward. Um, and then also the carbon budget. Uh, so there were recommendations associated with um, each, each piece of work that I just mentioned. Um, and I think uh, just in, in looking through the document again, I was actually really pleasantly surprised to find that we are moving forward on a lot of these pieces or have already made significant progress in, um, in acting on these recommendations. So I, I feel like 
good work, everyone. <laughs> it's, it's really positive. I don't think other subcommittees are necessarily in the same position. So I feel like we've all worked um, really hard and the agencies have worked really hard to, to put forward these proposals and to find money to do this work, um, which is really positive. Um, but I, I'm, I'm open to suggestions on, on how to review these different pieces. Um, and, and, you know, just honestly, Jared and I haven't had a lot of time to talk about as co-chairs how to go about this. So Jared, please chime in. Um, but, you know, it, just looking at the recommendations themselves and the climate action plan, you know, it might be good just to briefly walk through all those pieces and talk about what we have done and hear thoughts about what, what work is needed in addition to what we've done or what work we might not have started. So that would be my proposal, but go ahead, Jared. Yeah, I, I agree with that, Megan. I think that's a good way to start. I would say my, my broad kind of sense of, of where we stand in this moment is, you know, we've had the last two years of identifying research and analysis needs and other budget needs. Um, and, you know, thankfully, many of them have have secured funding. And it feels like this year is is mostly a year of, of doing that work and the implementation and execution of a lot of that. Um, I think the challenge is that there is likely, I, I can't speak for things like the Municipal Vulnerability Index or the Ag Emissions RFP, but I think it's very likely that for the life cycle analysis, we're going to come up against a budget limit. And we've even talked about phasing that um, so that we can get some pieces for sure done. But some of the, the pieces that we are looking for, to my knowledge, have, have never been done. Um, specific to Vermont in terms of uh, upstream emissions related to our electricity portfolio, which is a very complicated task. I think the challenge is we're not going to know how far through that scope of work and tasks the consultants are going to be able to get with the uh, committed budget. So we don't know how much the gap will be. Um, so I, I do think that for the most part, we're in a year of execution. I but I do think that there's likely going to be new budget needs that emerge throughout the year. It's just hard to, to put an explicit kind of, you know, X dollars would be used for this with where we stand now. But I also don't want to get halfway through the year, realize that we don't have the funds and not have the recourse to secure the funds that would be necessary to continue the work. It makes me think, is there is there a way that we could put a placeholder for, you know, a... Um, you know, an, an amount of, of funds to, you know, conduct further research and analysis following up on the, the work that has already begun. I, I think for many of those, they're, they're not going to be finished with the current contracts. Um, uh, I don't know what that, what amount that should be. I mean, the initial, I mean, I could throw out a suggestion, but that, that would be my thought when it comes to the analysis. In terms of the public engagement and outreach piece, I do think that that's really important. I think most of that will likely happen through the other subcommittees that um, are kind of more public facing in terms of getting general input on you know, mitigation strategies, on just transitions, whereas a lot of our work is kind of technical and peer review and research and analysis and you know it doesn't it doesn't lend itself to outreach and public engagement activities in quite the same way i'm not saying that there shouldn't be public engagement and outreach on some of our work but we usually work in service of those other committees so i, I don't immediately see a big need for uh, the science and data subcommittee to request funds specifically for our work in that in that space um, but would be interested if to hear if others dis disagree. I think that the biggest um, challenge we are going to face, uh, and this may be more of an issue for the steering committee, but I do think it would be valuable for each subcommittee to lift this up, is that in the proposed kind of reordering of staff and the, the, the way that the climate office will function, I, I am concerned that Jane and Marion have done incredible work as GWSA Global Warming Solutions Act Director and, and Coordinator. And in terms of available support for, to just help manage and communicate across the work of the subcommittees and the council, I, I know that there's this sense that we finished the climate action plan, now we're more onto implementation, but I, I don't know as though we are 
that far away from having to update the plan and then begin working on a new plan. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to see us have that capacity completely taken away and then be trying to, to restart from, from, from nothing if Jane and Marion are transitioning to new roles. So I do think that there's an important question that applies to all subcommittees, the entire council around capacity to support the work of the council in the way that Jane and Marion have done to date. Those are my initial thoughts, but would love to hear from others. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, sorry, Jared, I'm gonna disagree. Um, in that I, I try to put myself in two worlds. One is the climate policy world, but then also outside of the climate policy world. And when I'm outside the climate policy world, talking with people, their awareness of what goes on in the climate council is really close to zero. And yes, there can be communication with regards to the policies, but to be honest, things like the clean heat standard, while we wish the public would embrace the topic and participate in the deliberation, most of them don't. But the pieces that I think they can relate to are the, just what I was talking about before, the trends in personal fuel use to recognize, to help people recognize, especially consumers and to some extent businesses, their role in the climate crisis. And if we can take some of the work that we do in, in reporting on how things are going, I think that is a very, very important role that currently is, is not being pursued. So I, my preference would be, and I don't think it's a lot of money, but to explore what it takes. And I'm interested in Leslie Ann's reaction to this because she's, you know, she's the expert and she attempts to communicate all the time. But if we can explore what it can be to get more of this information out through media channels and whatever other technologies are available and develop some concise reporting that lets us know, lets our Vermont public know progress I think that's hugely important. And I think that's this subcommittee's role. So happy to respond to that, Ken. And it, it's interesting because I was thinking about this last night and again this morning when um, um, Megan's email came through. And one of the things that I think is, is, is important is that ability to sort of get the word out and I'm coming at it from a slightly different perspective. I'm actually working with um, Sandy Wilmot and some other folks in the town of Underhill, um, their task force. I had spoken to them back in May and we were talking about all of the, the ways in which um, climate change and risks and vulnerabilities affect um, local towns, um, rural towns and what that looks like. And then I decided this semester to actually take one of my classes, which is climatology and natural hazards and have them work alongside with Sandy and other task force members to actually tease out what those risks and vulnerabilities are so that we can try and implement some of the pieces that are in the climate action plan at the local level and doing a lot of this in support of the work that's coming down the pike both with the, the climate toolkit, but also with the municipal vulnerability index. So trying to kill a few birds with the same stone in the sense of, of um, implementing on a small scale and seeing what we can do in terms of scaling up. And part of, of why I decided to do this was because um, listening to, to the, the task force, who is deeply embedded in, in all of this work and realizing that it was still a little bit overwhelming to actually sort of dissect and tease apart and use all of the pieces that we've come up with in the Climate Action Plan made me realize that we do need to do a better job of not just the roadshow part of this, but also how do we make it accessible? How do we make it bite-sized? And whether it's from a visualization perspective, whether it's from um, little modules, whether it's from doing test cases or pilot cases, that was what I was gonna suggest as, as one of the things that we could be thinking about. And I also wanted to lift up, since I have the floor right now, I also wanted to lift up the fact that as our subcommittees um, expanded and grown and we have this new, wonderful, additional set of expertise, I think it, it would be great at this particular point in time to pause for a second and think about the ways in which our enhanced and, and great 
suite of, of geospatial technologies and economic analyses and social and behavioral science in the service of pure science, how that could be lifted up and, and brought to bear in how the committee sort of moves forward. So those are some of the things I was thinking about and ruminating about in preparation for uh, a larger discussion, because I think it's an awesome point in time to sort of capitalize on, on, on this new set of expertise that we all bring to the table. Thank you, Leslie Ann. I wanted to add that um, I've been in private practice doing psychotherapy for about 30 years. And I think one of the questions we're facing in this committee is how do we bring about change? And how do people, what will inspire people to change their lifestyles and give up things they're attached to and ways of living that they're attached to so that we can preserve a livable planet? And I used to hope that if people had good information, accurate information, they would use that and just change things. And some people will, and in my experience, many people won't because they're very attached to the lifestyle that they have or it's too expensive or something like that. So I think um, looking at these underlying pieces of how do we bring about change is really important to getting results here. Thanks, Catherine. Tara? Yeah, thanks, Megan. Uh, I think I just want to piggyback on what um, I think all comments have expressed so far. Uh, starting with Jared's, if we are the science and data subcommittee, I, I agree that capacity to actually house and maintain some of the data on an ongoing basis will be critical. So we don't lose data sets or the trends or the conclusions from the analysis of those data as people evolve or, or uh, into different roles or as the subcommittees change in nature. So where are all of the data being housed and are they being backed up and saved and stored? And that's just something that comes up frequently because as, as researchers, when you kind of go looking for data, it's like banging your head against the wall sometimes because it's not in obvious places or it might be in four different places without uh, kind of showing us the breadcrumbs of where to go from one to the next or how to get there. So if as a committee, we can get the right um, resources and that includes the funding to, to have um, someone or a group be responsible um, for, for some of those data management practices, I think that would be really beneficial for, for all aspects of, of the Climate Council. Um, and, and then in specifically with the outreach, I, I agree, uh, Leslie Ann mentioned a whole suite of different data types that we can be collecting and analyzing and really thinking about the cost connections as a committee or as a subcommittee. So how do we, how do we show that to the people who are not just the decision makers, but uh, ground level up? So looking at um, outreach from the, I saw in the Just Transitions, uh, worksheet that you sent out, Megan, that they had K-12, they had uh, community outreach. So across all sectors in Vermont, what, what does data mean to different audiences and how can we make the case that we're trying to make in this subcommittee um, and, and show those correlations visually um, or thematically or kind of showing the cross connections across the areas that as Leanne talked about, I think will be key in making a, a unified argument. Um, and so those were things that I've been thinking about and hoping they make sense. Thanks. And if I could just respond to that really quickly before um, Kevin and Claire, if, if that's okay. Um, I, I completely agree with those comments and um, just want to kind of provide some some context for, you know, how we have, um, you know, managed and housed data related to our emissions inventory and other related projects at the agency. Um, and, and Colin is still on and so can speak to this as well. But, you know, for a long time, um, when we compiled and released the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, it was it was a pretty non-event. Not a lot of people took notice of that. And um, I know Colin does periodically get requests for the underlying data that goes into the inventory. It's been more so recently, but for many years, um, 
it, it was not, we were not really <laughs> in the spotlight. Um, you know, not to say that we were not, you know, managing the data properly. I, I believe we are. Um, but I think with um, the uh, Global Warming Solutions Act and um, the and and the work of this committee, uh, and and for other reasons, it's obviously becoming very clear that we need to um, make the the data um, that we analyze more accessible to the public. And I think there's a few ways that we're looking at doing that right now. One is through the measuring and tracking progress tool um, that uh, Colin will be managing and that will be developed and will be a new and different way to communicate progress related to greenhouse gas emissions and also the mitigation and resiliency work as well. Um, and the, the purpose of that tool is to be a better communicator of that of that data and that information so that the public can much more easily access and understand um, what what's happening and how they're impacted. So um, I think that uh, it, you know, that's that's one mechanism. Um, and in Colin's work uh, with the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, we're taking you know an, another look at at how we communicate that body of work to the public as well, because that's a, a different tool than the measuring and tracking progress tool. Um, but also just you know figuring out ways and looking at how other states do this to make data more accessible to the public um, in in terms of of putting that piece of work into the world. So um, I just wanted to add that 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 we are actively looking at how to make changes to address all the comments that you made, Tara, and that you made, Leslie Ann. So, um, and, and Colin or, or Jared or Julie or others, if I missed anything, please let me know. But I think that's definitely a reaction that we're having at the agency is that we need to be putting this data into the world a little differently. <laughs> Can I jump in just before Kevin mm -hmm. and, and Claire, um, just to remind folks um, that we also have the expertise of the Vermont Center for Geographic Information and John Adams as part of our subcommittee. And so um, a longstanding commitment to getting geospatial technologies and, and then data and data sets around that. And a lot of the ISO standards that need to be in place, um, John has been talking about since, since the beginning. So I just wanted to you know, piggyback on what you just said, Megan, to make sure that we all reminded that we we do have some of that expertise as well to sort of amplify. So yeah, Kevin. That's great. Um so I, I, I had comments and then I get more comments as people talk, so I'm gonna work backwards. Um I think we have to realize that we're aliens in this picture. We are not the humans. Like we're coming from a different planet and have landed here. Um, and so the more, because I used to be more like Catherine and thought if I gave people information, they'd make good decisions. That is not how humans behave. That's how aliens behave like us, but that's not how people behave. They make bad decisions on spur of the moment uh, based on little or no information or wrong information. Um, and that's what the data says. And so there is a whole science and data field about how people make decisions that I don't think we have used very much. And so I think we could use being the data people, we could use more data people, more data on has anybody in Vermont actually read our plan? And I bet you that number is very, very small. Um, and then about how our recommendations actually what are effective ways to communicate recommendations out to the public? Because there is data and science around that. Um, and it's and it's interesting kind of stuff in the behavioral world. So that's the kind of the data and science about communicating out there. What my particular thing and the way I come at this and in, in having actually read the plan, um, I there are two places where I would like to see some data gathered and I don't know if you've already tested somebody to do this or not so if you have just whack me um, one is around land use and we have very little and land use uh, policies and, and practices we do not have good data on land use in Vermont we don't know if land is being sold if forest is being chopped up where houses are built all that type of stuff very very poor data on that and we really have no data um, and to me, an, an unwarranted um, optimism in our regulations. People think Act 250 does a lot, and Act 250 does virtually nothing in most cases. Uh, and so it would be lovely to have 
what we have as policies and programs, and then actually what's happening on the ground so we could get a better data going between those. Um, I talked to the legislature last year and explained that that both, most of what we have doesn't do anything on the ground. They were a little shocked like that. Oh, Active 50, isn't it? And I'm like, no, I can go out and do stuff tomorrow in many of my towns and I don't need a permit from anybody to do anything. Um, so we could use permit data. We could use actual subdivision data. There are some data feeds around that because subdivision plats are now um, being digitized and sent to the state, but we don't have anybody managing that information. The thing that I really um, other that actually went back to something in the plan and something that uh, which I'm looking at. Um, and I don't know if anybody is doing this stuff It's on page 225 of the plan. Um, an action is fun to study that qualifies basically does a compact land use pattern result in a different energy usage than a spread out land use pattern, both driving around and other things. And um, there are many reasons why a compact land use pattern is a good idea, but from a straight energy side, seems like we don't know the answer. And has, is that one of our things where we need some money to go have somebody find that answer? So, yeah, I, I have a feeling that um, Colin's gonna answer your question. So I'm gonna just, sorry, Claire, I'm gonna call on Colin. Sure, and, and I'll be brief. And I don't know if it entirely gets to your question, but I did just want to bring up quickly um, that VTrans is currently doing a study, uh, and I'm blanking on the name of the contractor that is working on that for them. But um, it's a it's a VMT reduction study, and in that they are kind of putting together. Uh, I won't go into the details, but they're essentially trying to get at that kind of development pattern and the influence on different travel behaviors and kind of land use, what is where and how that impacts certain trips. And, and they're getting down to the level of um, they're, they're incorporating like passive cell phone data for that analysis. So it seems like it could be an interesting, an interesting outcome there. And it's just kind of at the beginning stages right now, but that is one thing in that space generally that that's ongoing that I just wanted to flag. Good. I, I'd, I'd love to see that kind of made a little more holistic and that the energy isn't just you drive back and forth and, and whatnot, but yeah. there's energy in building roads. There's carbon sequestration loss when we put a house on here versus put a house over here uh, and all that other type of things that probably isn't in V-Transit's head. For, for sure. Totally agree. But just wanted to let you know that that was one piece of it anyway that was related. I'll, I'll also just, sorry, Claire, to keep delaying the calling on you, but I'll also just add that um, we are, Vermont is also participating just in, in terms of land use analyses. Vermont is also participating um, in a regional effort um, to uh, identify um, and implement better data sources related to land use. Ali Kasiba, who was our climate forester at the agency up until a couple weeks ago, she's now at UVM um, and hopefully we'll still work with her in her new role, but um, she was leading that um, from Vermont's perspective. And so we're, we're trying to, to carry that work forward um, within the agency. Uh, to, um, and, and I think it's, it's kind of similar to what we're doing on the ag side of things is to identify you know, the best data sets and the best tools that we can to get a better handle on um, uses of land in Vermont from different perspectives. So that's that's another piece of work that's already that is, is in process too. And I think we've partnered with at least two other New England states in doing that work and that's being funded by the US Climate Alliance. Yeah, and I'll just jump in for half a second on that and that a lot of that work is going to be more focused on kind of like the natural land conversions there, I think there will be ties into the kind of built environment but, but I agree with you Kevin that that's a really important kind of component that I'm not sure that I know that anybody is really studying in depth right now that I think would be interesting and that that kind of gets at the more yeah holistic kind of buildings and um, and travel patterns and that that you're talking about energy use. So thanks. All right, Claire, thanks for being so patient. 
Okay, please share Kevin's thought that it's hard to take minutes and hold on to my thoughts and have new questions at the same time. But um, so I think first I was just gonna speak in support with what Ken initially said and what others have supported that I think there is work to be done about um, communicating our science and data out to the public and just generally raising awareness. Um, you know, for those who may or may not be aware the Department of Public Service recently opened this process to review our renewable um, clean electricity programs and policies. And I think through our, we put out a request for information on that process. And some of what we heard is it's just such a complex topic and there's such a need for just educating to create sort of a awareness and understanding and language so that we can even conduct this, this review. Um, so we're doing a lot of thinking about that at the department. And I, seems like Tara kind of raised this, it seems like a great point of collaboration with the Just Transition Subcommittee, which you know has shares a charge around public engagement, but I wonder if it actually deserves sort of, if we were to put together a budget similar to what they did a specific line item for, you know, communication of science and data. Um, that was the one point. And then the second, I actually thought Kevin might raise this point, but um, related to a kind of a separate thing that we might consider about budgeting is, um, it wasn't in the climate action plan as a recommendation, but it was part of our original scope, which is about identifying data gaps um, needed for energy and climate analyses, both at the state, but also the sub-state level. Um, and I just wonder if that's something that we might spend some time thinking about. Um, the department works with the RPCs and the local energy committees on enhanced energy planning. And we've just heard, you know, I think since the beginning of that process, that there really is just a lack of data available to support those analyses. And the department is currently working with the regional planning commission to take sort of the analysis we did with the LEAP model to support the climate action plan and the comprehensive energy plan and actually regionalize that to support them in that work. And I think that going through that process is just once again raised where there are some gaps in available data at that level to support um, their work, which is really critical in moving this forward. So just also wanted to highlight that as potentially something we could think about. Thanks, Claire. Richard? Yeah, I raised my hand. Like like, uh, like Claire, I originally, originally raised my hand to say one thing, and then I have a couple of reactions to things that people have said since I raised my hand. Um, in, in the Florida Department of Health, we used to say that nobody should say that our activities were not faith-based, that we had faith that if we did the right things, the right results would follow. And... Um, that's not always true, that you do have to actually look and see. I, I do, I, re, I really appreciate uh, Kevin's comment that, do we really know that uh, uh, building communities with a compact building pattern actually saves energy? It's plausible that it would, um, but I'm a little bit surprised to learn that we don't actually have data to that effect. In the health uh, realm, there's moderately good data saying that a compact development pattern leads to changes in people's exercise behavior, um, that they walk more and they exercise more when they in a, in a compact development uh, setting. When things are closer, you actually walk more than when they're farther away. Um, and, you know, I don't know that literature intimately. Actually, probably Jared Ulmer, who's on the call, probably knows that the, the, the current status, that status of that literature better than I do. Um, you, some of those studies about changes in human behavior related to the, the built environment um, could be used to make inferences about energy use, although they would be inferences, not direct measurements. The other thing I wanted to just comment on is that, uh, uh, as Claire mentioned, local data gaps, and as I've said several times on this call, I've been working on an Addison County level uh, greenhouse gas inventory, and it's a real challenge because there are a number of parameters where we have good state, state reasonably good state values, but we don't have sub-state values. An example would be propane sales or um, fuel oil sales, and um, gasoline sales. We also don't gasoline and diesel sales. We also don't have on a sub-state level in any in any usable form, uh, and th those are important data gaps if you want people to do local analysis of the of the effect of local interventions. 
on energy use and, and greenhouse gas production. I'm done. So while I certainly want to invite other thoughts that folks have on budget uh, requests or priorities, I do also want to make sure that we um, are planning our next steps and that we leave time for public comment. So just working backwards, and I'm going to look to Megan to either add to this or <laughs> um, correct me, um, and others, of course, please, please jump in. But my sense from the last Climate Council meeting is that the deadline for council funding recommendations is October 7th, right? And so we don't have another subcommittee meeting scheduled before then. It doesn't sound like we're right now at the point where we're ready to make those recommendations. I think we've got some good ideas on the table, um, but it feels like there needs to be a little bit more specificity in terms of you know, uh, a specific description, um, amount, line item, and then we would have to prioritize that. So I'm wondering if we can actually do two things, um, which one might solve an issue earlier in, in the meeting. One would be, do we want to form a task group that would come up with a draft for the full subcommittee to consider meet sometime in the next couple of, of weeks so that we have a working draft of a proposal? Uh, for this subcommittee to consider and hopefully approve and move on to the council. The other thing would be that if we're going to do that, we would probably need to approve that as a full subcommittee before <laughs> that October 7th deadline. And I wonder if, um, you know, I know, Megan, you had originally had a conflict on, on a date in October to meet, but I wonder if it makes sense just to move a subcommittee meeting up, try to do it on, say, Thursday, October 6th, get a recommendation back from that task group. We meet on the 6th for October, see if we can come to agreement on a recommendation to forward to the council. And then we go to that uh, schedule uh, that I had suggested earlier um, for November and December the 10th and 8th. That would be my suggestion. And if folks agree, then I think we certainly wanna um, here who would like to volunteer for that task group so we can then get a, a scheduling poll set up for the next, at least sometime in the next couple of weeks. That sounds good to me. That's actually very similar to the process of just transition subcommittee used, um, having been part of that process as well. And I'm also happy to participate in that task group. I'd like to be part of the task group, but I can't meet on Thursday, October 6th in the, at 10. That being the case, Catherine, would you be willing to, um, you know, uh, being part of the task group, would you be willing to, um, you know, provide your input there via the task group, understanding that you wouldn't be a part of the conversation on the 6th, would that be okay with you? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I'm also happy to, to join in that task group and would mention to folks that if it's kind of feels too big of a request to add another meeting in the next couple of weeks, um, that you could certainly send thoughts or ideas onto, uh, it sounds like at this point, Megan, Claire, Catherine and myself, um, there may be others as well. Yeah, I'm I'm fine kind of just throwing something in there because I'm trying to um, look at what RPCs are doing also in the rural resilience side um, because I, I see many places where RPCs could potentially be doing things that other people are talking about. So, so maybe what we can do is find a time for that task group to meet. Once we know when it's going to be, send an email out to the subcommittee with a, a deadline for those written comments if you're not going to be part of it. So we have enough time to review it in advance before when that meeting is. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. 
So you're saying the meeting might not be on October 6th? Oh, I was talking about, the, sorry, Catherine, the task group meeting. I, I think it needs to happen probably week after next, but we need to find a time that worked for the task group. But once we can settle on that, so presumably that would be something like the week of the, sometime the week of the 26th or, I don't know, we'll, we'll have to see what can work for people, but I think we'd need to get any written suggestions in before that task group meets, before we do the full subcommittee meeting again on October 6th. Um, similar to, to Ken, I'm not able to be part of the task group, but there is, um, as alluded to earlier, there's a robust literature on, on behavior and energy use, actually. And so there's some, um, some papers that have been written for the explicit use of groups like this. There, um, there's some excellent stuff out there. So I'd love to contribute some resources and agree with, with a lot of the discussion that just occurred. Thanks for your input, everyone. But isn't the next science and data subcommittee meeting on October 13th? So yeah, yeah I think we're talking about maybe moving it up um, to uh, accommodate uh, the fact that we would have to meet again as a subcommittee to approve the work of the task group prior to the council deadline. Okay, so we're not meeting on October 13th. We are instead meeting on October 6th. I think that's the proposal, yeah. Okay. So once we schedule a meeting of that task group, um, we can inform everyone so that any written feedback can be provided to the task group prior to our meeting. So we can digest that going into those discussions. Um, and if anyone else um, you know, feels they, they're able to participate in the task group discussions, feel free to reach out to me or Jared after the meeting. I think a lot of, of the other subcommittees um, function the same way that they had a smaller group of folks work on it. And I think it's important for us to actually talk through stuff before it gets to the, the council itself. And I feel we've been a little bit, not at a disadvantage, but um, not in the same place as some of the other subcommittees who've had a chance to go through this and then present it full. So I think it would be great for us to have that opportunity before the next full climate council meeting. Yeah. Yes, Just Transitions definitely has gotten a great um, head start on this work. They've put a lot into this so far. So yeah, I think you're right. The other subcommittees still have ways to go, including us. And I really like the suggestion of um, sort of piggybacking or highlighting or doing a cross-reference to what other folks have done because it just elevates it as a cross-cutting piece that's critically important as a need. So to the extent that we can do some of that, it just sort of like highlights how important some of those pieces are. Right, so Leslie Ann, are you suggesting that we um, stick as closely as we can to the format that Just Transitions had already circulated to? I, not, not necessarily, but I think okay. the mere fact that our conversation, our discussions sort of brought us to that point of convergence of mm -hmm. having some of those elements of a behavior and decision-making and all that as important, I think that that sort of brings a conversation forward in a way that it is not as isolated or as siloed, right? And yep. what we're trying to do is we're all trying to benefit from this. And so if multiple subcommittees say the same thing, it means it's something that's important to multiple people. Got it, thanks. But on that other point that you brought up, Megan, I do think that the, the format that the Just Transitions Committee used is, is a helpful one to, to organize um, around. So we may want to use that as well as a starting point. Yeah. All right. Um, I guess we have um, a few more minutes before jumping to public comment. So if there's any other items um, either 
uh, building off of what we've already talked about or new budget considerations that folks want to bring up, um, we have a few more minutes to do that. All right, if not, um, we can move to see if there's any comments from members of the public. Or any other business that anyone would like to raise today. <laughs> Just brief, briefly, um, I have been meaning to send an email to the full council about this, and I have not yet with a link to our recently released annual progress report. But as folks who really appreciate uh, data and tracking and analysis, I'm going to put the link to our report here in the chat so everybody in this subcommittee can see it. Um, the other thing to know is that, oh, sorry, I didn't see your hand, Steve. Um, just brief, finish up really quickly. Um, that um, uh, there, all of the infographics and graphics that are in our report are individually downloadable and we make those free to use for um, organizations, uh, universities, colleges, energy committees, anybody who wants to use them. We, we appreciate the attribution, of course, um, so that folks know the source, but um, that's one of the ways that we're trying to help uh, make more accessible information um, easy to use and share. So uh, yeah, and if you ever have any feedback, we'd welcome it. But that link has the report. It has some key findings. It has links to where you can download all those graphics. Um, so I hope that's of use to some of you. Steve, sorry, I didn't see your hand. You're on mute. There we go. I, I'm struggling with my phone here to uh, find the buttons. So uh, yeah, thanks. This has been a great discussion. Uh, I uh, one thing that I, I want to throw out uh, regarding you know it's a, a, some great discussion about uh, uh, using data to uh, connect with people, to educate people, to help change understandings. And I guess you know good. I'll draw on my experience as an educator and make the point that there's no amount of data in the world that will replace personal conversations and direct communication. Um, especially in, you know, there's so many different ways to understand something. And, you know, you can understand superficially or, you know, everybody comes at something like this with different kinds of questions and you can't get that without really uh, talking and listening. So, that's, uh, I hope that uh, somewhere along the line, that is part of what happens. Um, that, that, you know, put those questions out, try to, try to frame um, uh, some kind of messaging, but, but uh, you, you really have to get that kind of feedback to, to make it right. So that's all. Thanks. Great discussion, everybody. Can I respond briefly to that? Um, actually, Steve, uh, the data supports what you just said, which is to say that there's something called the trusted messenger effect, which is incredibly powerful and potent and talking to people about these issues, people that we, especially people that we trust can be, um, you know, as impactful as anything else. So, yeah, great point. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, any other just general items before we adjourn? I'll just mention really briefly that um, the Agency of Natural Resources along with a lot of stakeholders and partners has been holding um, a series of public events speaking about trying to communicate our actions to the public. Um, related to um, our rules to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from motor vehicles and um, related to vehicle electrification. Uh, we've had um, meetings in 
uh, Manchester, Newport, and Burlington last night, and um, we're going to Bells Falls this evening, and then we have a meeting in Barrie next week, and then a virtual meeting next Friday. Um, so just wanted to give folks a, a reminder about that, and um, certainly welcome your participation, and our, we have uh, compiled a technical support document related to that rulemaking that includes um, an analysis uh, from Colin on the greenhouse gas emission reductions associated or that we expect to be associated with the rules um, as well as reduction in criteria air pollutants as well. Um, and then also of course the economic impacts that we expect um, both positive and negative to be experienced by Vermonters. So um, I can drop link to where all of that lives online in the chat, but um, we are definitely hoping to hear from as many folks as possible um, during our, our public engagement period, which the events do end next Friday, but um, we're open to accepting public comments until September 30th on that rule. So please, um, if you have an opportunity to share um, you know, this information with your network so that we can um, really understand how folks are reacting to this change, which is gonna be really significant um, in terms of trying to electrify our passenger fleet by 2035 entirely. So um, thanks for hearing me out on that. New sales by 2035. Yes, thank you, not, Jared. Not the entire, <laughs> not the entire fleet. I've, I've heard a lot of right. misinformation out there that people think yeah. that uh, it's... Uh, yeah. New cars. Speaking of trying to communicate things clearly, yeah. <laughs> thanks for that, right. Megan. That's great. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, everyone. It's nice to see you and hear from you, especially new folks. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Take care. Bye. Bye, everyone.